Governor. Gromit, get some cheese. Doctor Who. You call blimey. Cup of tea. Out of them. I'm out of Britishisms. Uh, Welcome, sorry. everybody, to the Two Fish at the Table Poker Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Legend of Ben on Poker Stars. And I'm one of your other hosts, East Coast Sam. Welcome to this little trip across the pond to the WSOP Europe in London, 2008. Not the first year it was televised, actually, but the first year it was broadcast here in the United States and brought on Poker Go. Uh, very excited for this one because Europe is, has an interesting feel to it in comparison to the Las Vegas one. A lot of interesting changes from what we've known and expected and talked about in the past. Really excited to go through this. And it, it also functions as kind of a time capsule of poker back in 2008, which we've talked about in our you know, podcast detailing that, that era of poker, mm -hmm. but this kind of takes place in the golden era, post Moneymaker, but pre Black Friday where a lot of top pros uh, at the time were trying to accumulate those, those all those valuable bracelets because the, the Europe main of uh, World Series Poker was pretty much brand new. It was in its second year of, um, of running. The mm -hmm. first year in 07 was only three events, followed with the main event being the concluding events. That was won by uh, Annette Oberstadt, the youngest main event winner in, in poker history, probably will be the record for forever. Right. Uh, she was age 18. Barely legal to play in uh, in England, and uh, still too young to play in America. And um, just a year a year later, in 08, they had four events in the Worlds of Poker Europe. Still kind of found in their way, not quite uh, expanding on the bracelet events like we have nowadays, where they have you know I think a little bit over ten, a bit more. Yeah, it's just you know amount you can count in your hand. And uh, it was a chance for poker pros to really kind of rack up some bracelets in these relatively small fields. This main event in 08 only had 362 players. Wow. And it had, it had kind of this combination of a field full of the top pros who were trying to accumulate bracelets, final tables, uh, European locals of sorts, and a lot of amateurs that really didn't want to fly across the pond to America for to play in the main event. But uh, some, you know, qualifiers, some, you know, young guns trying to make a name for themselves. And it really gives this main event a unique feel. Yeah, I mean, it's a unique feel in so many different ways. I mean, we have Lon and Norm as commentators this time around, but there's a really different editing style, even though this is made by ESPN's people. I mean, it was maybe intended more for a European audience than an American audience. But we have, you know, in comparison, especially with the Las Vegas 08 event, where we had sort of darker sort of scenes, almost like the back room of some illicit gambling you know, place. We have this beautiful casino, which is over two floors and all these tables that are pressed together. We have a feature table, but a lot of the time is spent outside of that table, showing the other people who were in the room. I mean, Doyle Brunson wasn't at the feature table. They had a lot of big names that weren't at that table. And so they're going around the room, showing these different names. And these people are like standing next to the table and spectating, you know, all crammed in. It's this very interesting feel. They keep talking about the salads that the players are eating. It's, it's just has such a different, more interesting feel to it and i was really surprised by it it's kind of like a james bond casino where bond walks yeah. down from the top balcony down to the first floor to, to fight off the villain in a game of poker uh, <laughs> it's kind of that that atmosphere to it and it's certainly a less tense tension filled main event everyone's a bit more relaxed mm -hmm. uh, because it's a much smaller feel it's less than half the field that moneymaker won the main event in so you know even a total amateur you know you have about a you know one in three you have a, 0.3% chance of winning this whole thing just by sitting down. Uh, this main event shares a lot of similarities with the main events uh, in Las Vegas at the same time, 20K starting stack, multiple mm -hmm. day ones. Uh, this is an eight episode long tournament on Poker Go. The final two episodes are for the final table. And then you have two different day ones, day two, day three, day four, and uh, then the final table. And it's a very unique main event in that it kind of combines the styles of the classic main event episodes of the post classic main event era. And then also kind of the modern day where it's kind of this light documentary feel because there's, mm -hmm. there's montages fast forwarding through the action that they actually mentioned the players going on breaks, uh, the blinds are mentioned, the notable chip stacks, the chip average are regularly shown. So it, it kind of keeps you um, in this sort of, it's a hybrid of combining the different things that we've watched so far. And for me, it really works. It makes it feel unique. Yeah, I mean, they have cameramen going around the venue 
And they're clearly cutting to these hands as they're happening, which adds sort of a little bit more of an action feel, even though I would have liked to have seen the pre-flop action and seen the hands unfold. There's a lot of hands that are cut to after the turn, not just after the flop, but after the turn. Uh, but it does add sort of a little bit more of a tense sort of in the moment feel. You know, you're going from this table, now all of a sudden you're going to that one, now you're going to this one, now you're going to that one. You know, it adds sort of, it adds an energy that you wouldn't have otherwise. Poker go, please have people roaming the floors with cameras next time, thank you. Same. Yeah, there's definitely less emphasis on here's table one, here's the story of this table on day one. You know, Negreanu has a lot of chips, he's running over the table, yada yada, or somebody has a massive fall from being a chip. That's not really the focus of this uh, editing style. This is really just about showing us as many hands as possible, showing us as many players as possible, particularly because there's just so many notable faces in this field. The top pros of the time, past number niners. European top pros, complete amateurs, uh, definitely a bit of an emphasis on showing a chip leader from point X in a tournament, seeing how they're doing. So right. uh, again, it's a, a bit more about quantity than quality as far as the players spotlighted. Mm -hmm. But I think it kind of works because the field's small enough where um, it's not, it, it works as far as getting us from this crowded outer table field on day one to narrowing it down to a few players that we have seen here and there against each other uh, as the tournament unfolded. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point that you make quantity over quality because, I mean, there's so many hands in each episode and there's very little time wasted. There's a segment called Poker Slang where Norman Chad goes out in the town and asks uh, members of the public, hey, do you know what a bad beat is? Do you know what the nuts are, et cetera? But there's no the nuts segment. There's no side action championship. There's even very few interviews. I mean, there's maybe one or two in each episode. And they're fairly to the point, fairly rudimentary, just the player kind of just standing in front of a green screen, talking for 30 seconds at the most and then moving on to the next one. So yeah, I mean, I don't, I like having a lot of hands because then you can kind of show, don't tell. We see the player's personalities through how they play the hands, but I don't mind a little bit of backstory as well. And I would have liked maybe a little bit more of that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hear you there a little bit, but I also think that uh, I, I'm willing to, to look past a couple of uh, shortcomings here and there, just because of how you how this kind of re-energized me. Because you know, we were pretty down in the last few main events and yeah. I mean, broadcasts, and it was kind of nice to kind of have a completely different take on the same idea for a poker program, uh, you know, watching these episodes here. And it, it definitely... Uh, works for me. I guess my biggest critical is maybe some of the sound work a little bit off, you know, oh. because it's kind of just cameramen running around the room. People are talking, it's really hard to hear some on the table talk sometimes when you have Lon and Norm talking over them. Um, but really, besides that, I really liked the, the skeleton of this main event. Yeah, and there's some interesting editing choices. Like sometimes they'll have a graphic of like the top three players and they'll just be like this cool graphic of this little video of the player above their names and then it flashes. And there's like black and white photograph of it. I thought that looked really cool. All the font choices were really interesting too. I liked all the graphics. Graphics were nice. And it also kind of predated the American main events in having sort of a tournament detailed graphic on screen. Yeah. Whether, whether that means the... Uh, the chip counts, the top chip stacks, the notable chip stacks in the field, the chip average. The main event in America really didn't do that until 2010, 2011. So uh, they had had their number by a couple of years with, with a wise choice like that. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, just getting right into this, this recap here, uh, episode one is day 1A, where a little under half the field, 159 players uh, mm -hmm. pop in. And table one, we get some, some pretty big names together. We got Phil Ivey, Mike Madisau, and Steve Zolotow. And again, mm -hmm. I, I say that we have a pretty good table one. Uh, the roster on table one can change so quickly sometimes that it, it almost doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things for that episode. But at least on day one, they had some stellar, consistent lineups throughout the duration of the whole first episode. So that's why I feel it, 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 it warrants mentioning it now. Yeah, I mean, I'm very surprised how quickly table one changes. It's not even necessarily a breaking. It's like players just bust, and so they bring in a new player, which is fine. I mean, there's no big deal, but it just goes to show. I mean, usually, at, you know, in years past the feature table, very few changes, very few. You know, they would really spend time focusing on a group of nine players, even if those players weren't particularly interesting. But here, it's just steady clip of eliminations. Mm -hmm. And so as... Um... Table one, Ivy gets involved with some, some pretty brutal action when he loses a bases against tens. Uh, later goes against Ebus in this episode, where's the EPT? Great line there. 
considering they're already in Europe. Uh, but really, this episode is all about the outer table action because my list of all the players in the outer table is, is just it's three lines long in my Word document here for my notes here. You got Helmut Elio Lezra, Shane Warren, a cricket player, and you got half of the of the 08 number nine. Keeping in mind that this this main event took place in between the break of the uh, and during the break of the 08 main event, so the the number niners haven't figured out how, you know they're, they're they're preparing for their final table in Las Vegas for November, so they're they don't know how much they've won yet, so they're trying to you know keep the momentum. Uh, going for yeah, their poker game, and uh, particularly with Demidov, you got to admit he definitely has uh, has that you know poker mojo flowing at this point in time in his life. Yeah, I mean we'll be talking quite a bit about him during this podcast, but yeah, props to these guys for you know I imagine they were doing a lot of preparations, a lot of coaching during this time to go all the way to London, you know miles away from where they live and try to play this tournament, which again wasn't super super high profile. I mean yeah, this was the main event in Europe, but this was only the second year they were doing it. They're still going to take time out to go and do it. Not to mention the money is you know you're not going to have nearly the amount of money in the prize pool as the main event, which you know had was in the you know 6,000, 7,000 range at this point in time. So really it's only about 5%, not even 5%, just a, a, a you know a throwaway that the top price, the, the price pool is in pounds. So uh, you, you know whether you want to convert that to $08 or 2021, $2022 is, is up to you. But again, considerably less money than uh, what the final table was guaranteed uh, at the time and for that main event. Yeah, I mean, for, you know, in terms of the actual hands that are within this episode, you know, not too many super exciting hands. I mean, this is day one, a lot of the players are getting a feel for each other, but we do get quite a bit of talk between Helmuth and Elezra. Elezra makes a prop bet to Phil Helmuth to see whether or not he gets to 35,000 chips at any point during the tournament. And it's just hilarious to see the two of them just talking at it continuously. They have a great rapport with each other. We also get a segment devoted to Helmuth entrances. And for this one, because he was in London, he got a double decker bus and also a stretch limo with other people dressed as him, which I just think is, he's like, it's just so good. I can't, I, there's no words. Really, really the help me with Ellie Ledger side bet subplot is my favorite part of this episode because El, yeah. at one point, Ellie Lezra um, actually tries to get out of the bet, tries to buy his way out when he loses a pot to helmet. That, 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 that's like a nightmare scenario. You're, you have a side bet of help me with buy his chip stack and then you literally give him some chips like, it messes with you on so many levels. Like, so I totally get why he'd want to buy out of that, that uh, side bet. It was very funny. And during part of this sort of subplot of Helmuth, he actually doubles up against Gordon Veo, of all people, the, the young pop Gordon Veo, a full eight years before his uh, final table appearance in 2016. Uh, and so it was kind of one of those cameo, oh my God, it's him from that time, from that place uh, moments for me as well. He looks so different. It's just yeah. unreal. He has a beard and a hat and everything. It just doesn't look. It looks right. older. It looks older. Yeah, basically, <laughs> of the beard. I guess the beard adds ten years. And so um, they also had a bit where they showed kind of this, like poker model, like tournament where they had a bunch yeah. of like these you know attract above average attractive women playing poker. It was a very short bit, so it wasn't really clear what exactly um went into that tournament like what what the what the rules were or how it how it how it formed it was very odd but uh i definitely want to research that and, and find out more about that particular tournament yeah and there was also a segment uh led by andy black about poker in ireland and all these people sort of not playing texas hold'em but just kind of playing poker at this bar in ireland and watching it at 2x speed and their accents i could not understand a thing they were saying no offense but yeah, i mean a couple small touches here like the ireland bit kind of lends itself to a, providing a little bit of a flavor of the European sort of culture, uh, European world. You know, if you watch some other uh, European poker shows, they, they do a little bit of that, like the Alpha 8 or the EEC. Yeah. There's, there's a few bits there. It's kind of a light version of, of those sort of segments to give the presumably non-native to that country's audience a taste of the culture of that place. Absolutely, yeah. And so again, my analysis of this episode is just kind of, it's a similar but different style. You know, it's the same yeah. idea, two hands shown at a table and, you know, that we see the action, but it's just, it's presented in a slightly different angle, a slightly different way. And so uh, when we're picking apart each main event year after year, it, it, you know, this obviously will, will jump out as a substantial change. And I think it's, it, it works. Same here. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I have a couple little things to gripe here and there, but yeah, I mean, it is a definitely a good change of pace. Mm -hmm. 
which leads us to day uh, 1B for episode two, with Pat, which has 203 players to complete the field. No, no Max late red here. Sorry, Matt, so no yellow. Mm -hmm. And uh, really the, the main story of sorts is of Annette Oberstad, her defending uh, attempts at, at, you know, going back to back, which again, is always one of my favorite parts of every main event is seeing that the defending champ try to repeat or at least make a deep run. And mm -hmm. while Annette does bust in this episode uh, after some, you know, battles with Marco Traniello of all people, uh, she does, you know, carry herself pretty well. She will, I, I don't recall the OS of main event year super well, but she really wasn't uh, all that present in the edit for the most part. And mm -hmm. so she definitely gets a, a better, you know, foothold in, in, the, in the narrative of this episode. And, and she, I think she, you know, comes across pretty well getting bluffed into it by, by, with uh, these monster hands over and over again. Yeah, I watched the 07 main event a couple years ago. It was on YouTube and somebody uploaded it. And it was okay. I didn't really feel like I had a really great sense of Annette Oberstad until the final table or the later action. And then I remember the final table being portrayed. It was just bust outs with like one or two other hands, three way and like one or two other hands heads up, which I really hate because you don't get any feel for how the final table works. But yeah, I mean, you do get a better sense of Annette's personality. She gets a segment where she talks about how she always wanted to win a bracelet. So of course, winning one right before you turn 19 is a big deal and she's traveling a lot more now. And yeah, we get a lot of hands with her, really good sense of her play. You know, they kind of talk about how, you know, she's a little bit more aggressive than most players, but I mean, she had aces at one point, she had pocket fours, she had a lot of very big hands. So we don't get a super great feel for that, but we do get a sense through her bet sizing and so on that she can be a bit aggressive. Yeah, and you know, one of the differences I noticed in this episode was that in a couple hands, at least one, the limpers pre-flop were not actually shown with graphics of their cards or their chip yeah. in, in the graphics during a hand. It was very strange. I guess, I mean, they weren't particularly relevant to the main action of the hand, but nonetheless, the standard had always been the main event. If, you, if they're entered or pot, their hands will all appear on the side of the screen to represent that their action. So that was different, I guess. Uh, again, you know, OCD attention grabbing, uh, rewatching poker here will notice it, but I don't think it was uh, a negative, just, just an observation I had. Yeah. And even though, I mean, this really is the Annette Oberstad episode, she starts off with this, you know, montage about Annette. It really, as Fondieri steals the show, I mean, let's just be honest here. He's talking, he's just talking, not incessantly, but he's just coming up with nicknames, calling Annette Oberstad the Queen of Europe, saying it's an easy game when she wins hands. Just so many great moments with this Fondieri and Phil Locke, for that matter. It's just, yeah. it's, and that it's, table also, we got Johnny Lawton, we got the classic game, what does Johnny Lawton think? <laughs> which is kind of a funny little thing, you know, again, trying to occupy the minds while you're at the table for hours upon hours in, you know, day one B of the main event Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. Brent Kenny also pops in on that table. And um, so again, some, some names that a lot of people for, for better, for worse, will recognize in the, in the news lines uh, nowadays. Um, on the hour tables, again, we have again, a variety pack of players showing up there. JRB goes busto, not in quite as amazing fashion as he did in the main event. In America, yeah. uh, John Juanda. Wonder how he'll do in this one. Um, Dale Negreanu, who gets who becomes the day one B chip leader, which is a position he'll be, you know, in the top five of the ch chip stacks for pretty much the majority of the tournaments. Uh, pretty impressive t job by Negreanu after a pretty lackluster day one bust out in the main event in America that same year. Mm -hmm. um, and again, Devilfish, Gavin Smith, rest in peace. Um, a guy named Rosen is a chip leader for a lot of uh, day one. Uh, again, uh, one of those guys that will try to cut back saying he was the chip leader on, you know, for much of this day or whatever, and mm -hmm. seeing how far he ultimately does. So uh, it's not quite as fun an episode for me as episode one, because that just had, had so many names fly in. The Helmut subplot was really good, but otherwise, you know, it's still, it's still pretty good. I have some, um, some fun stuff on table one. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, there's this weird segment dedicated to this guy Baker who's an internet player and talking about he's not going to roll over but then he just busts at the end of the episode so it doesn't really amount to much they do it a couple times the same with like Shane Warren who was the uh, player featured in the previous episode they give him a lot of emphasis and then he just kind of busts anyway which is I think a little weird and kind of a waste of time but you know we get a little bit of sense of his personality I guess yeah so again, a, a, you know, a decent uh, day one action that kind of gives us just so many names that we know from rewatching all these main events. So that just makes, it makes the field feel that much more relevant and important 
because mm -hmm. we know these players. And so seeing them bust out means something, even as early as day one, it's just kind of fun to see players you, you know get really unlucky and really lucky. And so that adds sort of the, 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 the fun factor to it, even for other hands, it might just be kind of, you know, drill for day one in the main event. Yeah, absolutely. Which brings us to day, day two for episode three, where 179 players combined in those two days had survived. And this day two, Wills will fill down to under one third, oh, I guess a little bit over one third, to 62 players. Mm -hmm. So not quite uh, in the money yet. The bubble would be at 36 players, but really kind of the, the cream of the crop. Finally, you can't just, you can't hide uh, behind having a starting stack at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. Lines escalating. And so at table one, we get two of the top three stacks, Rosen and Daniel Negreanu, and this guy named Luke Schwartz Orbach. <laughs> I thought the same thing. And then uh, Phil Locke and Isaac Haxton, who mm -hmm. I swear looks like an entirely different person with his hair like that compared to the 2014 one drop where his hair is nice and short. Not like yeah, that now, but nonetheless. And then uh, at our tables, we have the conclusion of the Phil Helmuth side bet story, uh, as well as a lot of other big names like Mr. Benefield, or after Benefield from 2013, yep. uh, Scott Montgomery, uh, and... Uh, Tyler Tabai, who was the runner-up in the 07 main event Europe. So again, a, a very plentiful cast of characters had survived to day two. And there's some really, really strong day uh, table one action in this episode, if you ask me. Yeah, I mean, Negreanu is just, you know, right off the bat against this guy, Schwartz Arbach, with 5-3, mixing it up, 5-3 suited, and just excellent table talk just going back and forth between him and Schwartz and then after the fact you know he's talking about his hand with the other players he goes raise with five three what do you think I'm crazy and that's of course exactly what he did just brilliant table talk you know a lot of just whenever you have Negrano at the feature table there's just so much fun stuff and then when you have Negrano and Phil Locke at the table you have more fun stuff where Phil Locke actually makes a straight flush to beat an ace high flush to double up in a key juncture uh and then Negrano uh as Rosen's chipping down all episode long, he actually talks his way into making a good call to to uh, to, to, to pick off uh, Rosen's bluff on the river. So there's some some really good table one table talk related action and some brutal rivers on the outer tables. This is really yeah. kind of like some of the best poker of the whole main events, really, as far as crazy hands, coolers, brutal bust outs. Just some really good, just some really fun stuff here. Yeah, I mean, they do a good job. Yes, it's the feature table. Yes, you have these players you got to emphasize, but of spreading the action out. So you really just get a sense of just straight over straight, flush over flush. It's just crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott Montgomery kind of meets his end in a hand that kind of reminds me of the Paul Sneed Montgomery <laughs> hand with the Jack 7 ace 4, 5% to, to win the whole thing on the river. And uh, that, again, was kind of a fun little karmic thing. Obviously, he hasn't lost in the main event at this point yet. So, he, you know, he, he's, you know, hoping to save his luck, I guess, for the, for the important one uh, in November. But uh, just some really good stuff. And there's actually a hammer Thorell as aces against kings when an ace king was folded pre flop and he, the opponent hits the case king to win. And that was the, like just the cherry on top of an episode just full of bad beats and crazy happenings. Yeah, and Thorell doesn't shake his hand, which is just <laughs> mean to me. <laughs> Again, a good number of our familiar faces are busting. Phil Helmuth gets unlucky, limping in with kings. Again, and uh, his opponent flops a set of fives, and he ends up busting. So never quite uh, making it over the hump to win his side bet or even just surviving the tournament. So uh, luckily, Helmuth will have an even more entertaining end in the following main event Europe at the hands of Esfandiari. But uh, honestly, I'm, I'm, I was thinking almost halfway in those main event, really good stuff up to this point. Absolutely. Episode four is day three, which gets us from 62 down to 24. So it not, it's both the bubble episode and that first third of the field going out after the bubble. And mm -hmm. if you ask me, it's first of all, not a particularly memorable bubble to begin with. And yeah. I think the episode is also just extremely too fast paced to really leave any sort of uh, imprint on the viewer as far as this is day three of this, you know, this is um, only a six day long tournament with that kind of the two day one. So really day three is not day three as we think of it in, in Las Vegas, but uh, it's probably the episode that most suffers from just from way too fast a pace. 
Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of hands in quick succession, a lot of double up hands, you know, threes versus ace king, aces versus kings, etc. which again, it makes sense when you're at the bubble. I mean, it's kind of pump it or dump it. You don't really want to go out uh, on the bubble. I get that. And, you know, a couple little, you know, characters pop in here and there. Uh, but yeah, nothing, nothing too exciting. I mean, I always love bubble episodes because just the natural tension of the moment. It is, you know, queens versus ace king on the bubble seeing a flip. That's a little interesting, I suppose. Uh, we do have an interview with the bu uh, Bubble Boy afterward. He says that he made a huge error and he's bummed out for busting, which I guess is pretty predictable. And then the episode just kind of continues from there. I mean, there's a few more hands before the episode ends, uh, which is okay. I mean, it sh you know shows the tournament continuing, but yeah, nothing just super exciting in this episode. Yeah, it's probably the, 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 uh, the weakest one. And we do get Scott Fishman, no relation yeah. to us, sorry people. Uh, final, uh, who he, the, he gets kind of a, a, a tournament wide narrative of how he had that amazing four day stretch in 04 when he won two bracelets and kind of hasn't had much going since. And so that's kind of uh, one of the one of the you know small little you know narratives that, that exist here amongst the eventual final table is John Juwanda ascends into the chip lead here. And um, Mike Mattiso actually joins table one in this episode, but he wasn't really, he was really not really. Um, shown all that much up until this point. So just the fact that it's Mike Matisau in 08 after he, he you know, made that 30th place uh, in Las Vegas that same year. So again, he was having an extremely solid year of poker, probably possibly his best year of poker of his career, maybe even beside maybe 05. And uh, he's just kind of barely in this entire main event, which is really kind of a shame. I guess, you know, obviously there's not enough footage to, to really, you know, spotlight him more than I understand, but uh, just go to show you that there's so many, you know, top pros in this tournament that it's almost like to the episodes, to the tournament's detriment to the edit, because there's just so much to show. It's so it's just great to have all these top pros still alive with a handful of tables left to go in the tournament. Yeah, and there's also just, you know, some interesting lesser known players. This guy, Ruas, who does Chinese boxing with the grinder of all people, and he gets into a hand with um, Madison actually manages to get Madison off the hand when Madison is top pair. You know, so there's a couple interesting amateurs in there as well. And having, uh, you know, amateurs mixed with these professionals, it makes it more refreshing than if it was just the professionals. And we have talked about in years past the probably the worst six bets in poker history, but we definitely have possibly the worst five bets in poker history of Scott Fishman with 10 deuce to Bill Brunson. When he, he five bets that hand into both queens and kings pre-flop, and uh, it's just a, a massive fail for our boy Scott Fishman. No offense, buddy, but yeah, I think you gotta just uh, muck that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So again, at the halfway point of the season of episodes, we're down to our final uh, twenty-four players, which is really three tables of eight, and so episode five is the first time that we have one day of the tournament broken down into two episodes. Mm -hmm. So they play from 24 down to 15. So again, that's half of the bus test before the final table in an episode, you know, more or less. And so here the, the pace is starting to finally slow down a little bit, allowing the tournament to really kind of settle into a bit more into the style that we had seen in, in the American main events where each right. table's dynamic means a bit more the flow of chips is a bit more relevant and it's not just bust up, bust up, bust out. It's, you know, person doubles up, person wins another hand, person loses a hand. It's a bit more of a uh, stereotypical poker flow to the edit. Yeah, I mean, we still get a lot of hands here. I mean, don't get me wrong. A lot of interesting stuff. Adam's mixing it up. Demidov also mixing it up. Uh, this guy Shakir, she's also mixing it up. We learned a little bit more about some of these other players. This guy Smith, who got into a motorcycle accident and then decided to concentrate on poker instead. DeGranu talking about how it's easier to read Europeans, which is interesting for him to say, uh, but also mixing it up as well and managing to get away when one of the other players, Shakir, she has quads. Uh, you know, just a lot of interesting poker here as we get down to the home stretch. And it's funny because the episode was in kind of a hurry to get down to the final two tables. There's kind of a montage of the early bust outs. And then once 18 are left, the, the pacing definitely slows down a bit more from there because once you have two tables of nine, you know, it's again kind of playing down to that final nine. So it, it allows for uh, the table dynamics to really kind of matter a bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, guys like Mattis do meet their demise here. Andy Block goes out. Eric Seidel goes out. So again, still a handful of, you know, pretty relevant pros at the time are 
alive at this point. And uh, by this point, the the main players really are focusing on the top top chip stacks, and then Negreanu, right. Yolanda, um, and to lesser extent Scott Fishman as well uh, in there. Which um, again, it, it's a pretty solid episode still, despite my you know it's kind of this kind of a bipolar editing pacing style. One third in with the three tables and the two tables, but I still enjoy it. Yeah, same here, absolutely. But episode six gets us from the final fifteen down to the final table of nine. And uh, there's a, one pretty funny running gag in this episode where normal consistently say, I'll take the suited hand line, you take the unsuited hand when like Ace King suited runs into Ace King offsuit. Just kind of a funny little, you know, side joke by, by Norm there that I thought was funny. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And then Scott Fishman is kind of takes the role of table two chainsaw as he busts a couple of players out and, uh, you know, accumulates a solid chip stack taking him into the final table. Um, Table one, I mean, I, I didn't find the action particularly memorable for the most part mm -hmm. uh, prior to the bubble play. The bubble play itself takes up the final 10 minutes of the episode and was about an hour and 20 minutes in real time uh, in London. Um, and it's just kind of the, the Neff nightmare show, really. Yeah, this, this guy Neff, I mean, oof. I mean, 10s versus Ace King. Uh, 10, you know, he takes 10-8 into battle and loses. He sh finally shoves with Kings up against Demidov with ace-10, and Demidov manages to get there. So sick. Not to mention, that was after three hearts were folded and two aces were folded pre-flop for Demidov. So the odds were astronomically high for Neff to at least double up with the Kings there against the ace-10 on the bubble. But I, I don't feel as bad because the money they're playing for is substantially less. So bubble in the final table is less of a financial big deal than any of event prior to it or post it. Yeah, still a lot of money though, but yeah. <laughs> And again, as you might expect of any episode before the final table, it, it does a good job of at least giving us a couple of hands with each member of the final table so that we at least know a little bit, a little mm -hmm. bit about them. I'm, I still can't say this final table is particularly well characterized like some of our favorite final tables from back in the poker day, but it's, it's not as bad as some of ours that we just felt that we knew zero about half a table. We've at least seen all of them in a few hands and we know Fishman, Juanda, and Daniel Grano pretty well anyway, so that helps things as well. Yeah, I mean, they hype up this guy, Elliot, because he's the first live tournament that he's playing at. He'd also been a short stack throughout a lot of the build-up to the final table. He does make it by the skin of his teeth, thanks to Neff just getting hit by the deck, you know, and losing. Uh, there's also this sort of narrative of the Russians, uh, Demidov being, you know, sort of the guy that's being hyped up because he's at the November 9. But also uh, this guy, Alakin, who doesn't get like a super amount of attention beforehand, but when it comes to the final table, it's like, it's him and Demidov versus the world is the narrative that's established, literally the world. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see them building these narratives. But yeah, as I mentioned before, there's not too many interview segments. We don't hear directly from the players themselves. Just, you know, one segment for Elliot, one segment for Negreanu, stuff like that. But it's really through their table dynamics uh, and also Lon and Norm's commentary that we really get to know these guys. And yeah, I mean, this definitely felt a bit like a budget main event broadcast. You know, they didn't yeah. establish a stage for them to play on. You know, they're, they're just playing on regular tables. Uh, I mean, even the, the table one doesn't really feel any different than the outer tables because it's yeah. literally the same kind of table with, uh, but it's, it's designated as table one for the sake of the broadcast. Mm -hmm. which is not, not a bad thing, it just gives it, it gives it the future table less of that intimidating factor that maybe you might find on a live table where folks are afraid to play badly on the final, on the main table or something. And uh, it, again, because it, it just feels like a regular table, it, it, it definitely takes away a bit of the prestige or like the, the, the stadium sort of vibe that the final table yeah. would normally have. So, um, you know, leading into the final table here, which is uh, two episodes, the cinematography definitely feels a bit flat for a final table. It's unlike yeah. any other final table, you know, being shot as we've seen before, uh, which again, it, it takes away some of the drama. It's not, you know, it's brightly lit, you know, the, the stage in the, you know, 07 through 2010 main event was very kind of dark black walls and the people in the stands. It definitely doesn't feel the same way in this style. Yeah, I mean, it feels like, I think there's a couple wide shots showing the venue. They just got some chairs set up where the other tables used to be. Again, it's a very odd casino because there's two floors and there's also a bar and a restaurant and places for people to sort of walk around and gather around the tables versus how it is in Las Vegas where the players are kept separate from the, from the rail. 
uh, which, you know, again, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's just, yeah, it's a different vibe. It just doesn't feel as intimate and, and intriguing. It's more just, here's what it is. Here's your action, everybody. Mm. So the, the final table, the first half is nine players playing down to five, when really they probably go to down to four, let's be honest here. And yeah. uh, it's a, a lot of Fishman, Demidov, and Alakin really kind of uh, in this action. Uh, Negrano gets, a, 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 or Jelana starts in the chip lead and kind of, you know, fades down as Alakin really kind of emerges. Demidov accumulates a lot of chips as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the pacing is pretty, there the really aren't too many, really any forgettable hands. Like, you know, raise and takes or, you know, see a flop, flop, bet, fold. You know, that's for the most part not present. It's a, it's a pretty solid uh, mixture of hands selected for the final table, which mm -hmm. is all the more impressive considering that this was a 484 hand long final table. And exactly half of that was heads up. One of so the insane. final tables of all time. So insane. I mean, they, they do, jumping ahead for a moment here, they do this interesting heads up montage where they kind of just skip through it and they mention how it's the longest heads up match in history. And you can tell both of them are exhausted by the end. I mean, you can just tell in their body language. But yeah, I mean, stepping back to this episode, yeah, I mean, a lot of interesting action. It's a shame, you know, Juwan is an interesting player. It's a shame he just couldn't really get anything going during the first half. He had enough chips to work with. There is an interesting hand between him and Alakin right at the end of the episode where, uh, you know, Alakin manages to river it and Jawanda eventually manages to fold. But yeah, I mean, that's a sick hand. Yeah, and then, you know, the bust outs are fairly evenly spread. I mean, eighth through sixth kind of come in quick succession, but it takes a little bit of time to get to ninth. And then the gap between ninth and eighth is, is several hands where, again, we see a lot of action. So it's good that they're able to space it out like that. Yeah, I and mean, we discussed how it's, you know, the difference between having one episode of Final Table versus two, you really can have a few hands that aren't bust out hands. Yeah. And, uh, especially when, as the chips are exchanging sp uh, places, uh, that's, you know, it helps to add to the, how the flow that the table went from A to Z. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my theory on why the Final Table took so long was probably the blind structure, because if you remember, there yeah. were, this is the same blind structure as 2007 and 2008, which was a pretty aggressive blind structure at first, but with a relatively mm -hmm. small field, you're gonna eventually kind of get ahead of the elimination curve and you're gonna have a lot of big blinds in play at one time. And so you're gonna eventually have sort of a, a bottleneck of eliminations as the blinds are small enough that players aren't um, going out you know, in proportion to the blinds. And especially when you get to uh, heads up play the blinds were at the very end 40 and 80k and that was after playing a, a handful of levels just heads up so um, compared to a lot of the final tables in 2022 where you have like 25 big blind average everyone's like limping in right you know check folds to a one big blind bet on the flop a uh, different story here yeah, and also that we don't have Juwanda being the big stack, but Alakin was wasn't too far behind at the start of the table, and he also just wasn't really pushing players around. Again, that's because more because he was card dead than anything else. Uh, but yeah, I mean, very interesting table dynamic. Daniel Negreanu does make the final table. You know, so we haven't really been talking about him because he also just doesn't really get much going. Nothing really wrong with him. There's a segment where he talks about how he's trying to do a small ball approach and waiting for the cards and waiting to apply pressure. But yeah, it just doesn't really get much going. I mean, he manages to get a lake in to fold Kings on an ace high board, but that's nothing special. Yeah, it just doesn't, not able to unfortunately get too much going. He doesn't talk very much either, or at least they don't cut to him very often. He only, he only really participates in three hands. Hand number one, where he wins against Fishman. Hand number two, he's in, is the bluff of the ace high flop of, of like and those Kings. And then the hand he busts in, where he kind of sweats his cards, He's like, oh, okay, it was either it's a no across, so it's an ace two or three, uh, which is kind of funny, but when you realize he's up against Jax, it doesn't really matter. You know he's screwed <laughs> no matter what his cards are. And sure. so Negrano, again, it's our first time you've watched him at a final table, not kind of the 2014 one drop, where he was obviously one of the you know, major players there. So right. it's kind of a shame we, we couldn't really see much more of the master at work here. But um, to, you know, don't forget, in 09, though, he's going to return to this final table uh, in, you know, back to back years. And, and uh, do better than the first time. So uh, not quite good enough better, but uh, still better. And uh, yeah. we will discuss that one. We'll uh, hopefully see a lot more of classic DNEG action.
Yeah, and there is one funny moment where uh, after he busts out, he comes back and he tries to rebuy. Like, he even walks up to Jack's like, can I buy back in? Which I thought was a sweet moment. And he was also there to support Jawanda. And one of the narratives was how him and Daniel uh, were both very good friends. And neither of them had, you know, had super amount of success in the year before the events. They're sort of trying to use it as motivation to get back and compete with the young guns. Mm -hmm. uh, and luckily for Jawanda, it does turn out his way, so... Yeah, the, the first episode encompasses the first 125 hams on the final table, so a little over one fourth. Uh, mm -hmm. For the most part, there's not a ton of like massive gaps between hands in the selection, so it, it doesn't feel like you're missing a huge chunk of the story. I can't say the same for episode eight, the final part of the final table, because uh, naturally, when you when you have to cram in what amounts to 360 hands of play, you're going to obviously have some hand gaps between what you're showing. But uh, there's a couple of times where I really felt it hurt the episode. Uh, at, at one point, Demidoff is, is you know, the short stack, and then it skips over to the next hand. He's chipped up off screen considerably in yeah. order to have enough chips to lose a whole bunch to a Lakin, for example. And it's moments like that that kind of get me where it's like, well, like it, it, you, you skipped a pretty important part of his narrative there. Especially since it's Demidoff, the guy who was at the final table in, in, in Las Vegas this year, and is now in the final four in uh, in Europe. So that was a bit of a letdown. Yeah, they should have made this, I think, three episodes, the final table, and really just give them more time to space it out. I don't mind the heads up montage that I mentioned previously, but yeah, stuff like that three-handed where you have Demidov and you've also built this Russians versus the world narrative. Would have been nice to let that play that out a little bit more. So you've, you've mentioned the, the montage twice. That was so interesting to me, that entire yeah. montage. It was, it actually, we're watching at 2x speed. And it was actually a pretty long montage. Like I was like, wow, how much longer is this gonna go for? I know it's covering a lot of hands, but uh, I was surprised. So th that actual montage was essentially uh, a montage of 180 hands because it went from hand 299 to hand 479. So 180 hands sort of in that gap there. And it was again, back and forth, all in bluff, double up. Oh no, blah, blah, blah. And um, it, it was really something that we've never seen like before in any main event ever. So that was, um, for me, possibly the most interesting detail of the whole main event. Yeah, I mean, the little things, I mean, from what I remember of uh, how they treated Kui Wen versus Gordon Veo, I think they did a montage of just Gordon Veo folding. But it was just like a couple just really quick clips of, you know, Kui Wen betting and then Gordon Veo folding. Like this was like a really involved montage. Like they showed a late kid getting up to take a break, that Jawanda hit a lucky river. It also showed Jack Effel announcing that this was the longest heads up battle and it broke the record for the most number of hands. It was very interesting on a stylistic level. And, and it kept the audio of those clips in play, whereas the Martin Jacobson shove montage was just silent clips of him doing it for, or the Gordon Veo folding was, was not, was just of Norman Ch and Lon talking over it versus giving us the actual audio from the action that they were, they were doing a montage of. So that was, it's interesting. And I would say Jawanda uh, had the chip lead when heads up play began. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Alakin, you know, I, I don't think he made any terrible mistakes with the exception of saying, I'm just tired. <laughs> He's like, hi. Right whatever, I got a weak flush job, I'm tired, let's just go, like, it's, it's just, this is for a lot of money, it's just for a bracelet, you're going to be, you know, off your poker profile, and with Jawanda, you can't give him an inch, like, if you're playing a total amateur, and you can, you still think you have the, the skills to yeah. kind of outplay them, okay, take a chance to try to end it, but, I mean, against somebody who's, who's, you know, at the top of his game at that time, John Jawanda, I, I don't think you can make that call or that play. Yeah, absolutely, I'm absolutely with you, I mean, maybe he was a little frustrated that you know, if Juwan hadn't hit that lucky river, he would have won the thing. But you got to just stay focused, stay in the element, have your buddy bring you some coffee so you can keep going. Mm -hmm. Not to mention uh, the final hand of uh, heads up play. John Juwanda has trips on the clock <laughs> yep. and then rivers quads. But uh, we all remember the, the meme where Tony G has a royal flush, gets no money out of it. And then John Juwanda chimes in, I had trips very end of the hand so that's where the title of this podcast will come from is from from that quote but uh again it was a, it, that montage is the most no it's, for me it stands out as, a, as a, the biggest thing of the whole main event sort of uh season um yeah final table i think it's okay i don't think it's yeah so the worst it's okay and it does not i don't think it brings down or brings up the quality of this main event as a whole i think it, it's it keeps things steady and so overall it's a very solid package if you ask me 
Yeah, I mean, we haven't mentioned a couple of people that were at the final table. This guy, Sonner, who just kept getting lucky hand after lucky hand. A7 of all things. He just, he just loves A7. With A7, yeah, A7 of diamonds is just his go-to hand. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's a an okay final table. There's a couple interesting moments here and there. I did like Demidov's uh, segment where he mentioned that he got second place in a Russia tournament, so he just gets the final table everywhere he goes, which I thought was sort of funny. But yeah, I mean... You know, this, it's a decent final table. John Jawanda absolutely deserves it. And Alakin gave him a run for his money, too. Like, I wouldn't have been unhappy if Alakin had won this. Mm -hmm. I just wish, again, we'd had a little bit better characterization for some of these guys and that they would really let three-handed and two-handed play play out. I, I agree. But, again, if we were going to go back to our tiers that we made a few episodes ago, I'd probably put this in the, in the solid B category. Yep. It's not quite an A. But uh, it definitely got me in a good mood watching this. I, I didn't, I wouldn't, you know, bored or rolling my eyes watching this or, or, or anything. I, I, was, I was happy to see so many names of prominent poker pros at the time that I have been a fan of for a long time pop up here and there and be a part of the action. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited to watch the rest of the uh, Europe events, main events, and see what else uh, happens and whether the editing style changes at all. I have not seen any, any at all European post 08 i had seen 07 i hadn't seen anything from 08 and i haven't seen anything afterwards so i'm gonna be curious to see how it unfolds yeah and you know the the success of the worlds of poker europe would prompt another expansion a very brief expansion into the worlds of poker asia pacific right originally was meant to alternate year to year with europe until that uh, fizzled out in, in a not so spectacular fashion but um the europe it was a poker still continues to this day. It's actually coming up later this year. So we'll uh, see if any of the American pros uh, are willing to risk traveling over to, uh, to Europe to uh, try to, you know, make some money and some glory. Yeah. And, um, you know, as we speak, Sam, Mike the Mouth Mattisau is, is recording a The Mouthpiece podcast. Oh, wow. Well, I think it's only appropriate that we, I'm, I'm, just, I'm in front of this right now, we discuss our thoughts on his podcast, on our podcast. What do you say? Okay, sure. <laughs> so you know we i've talked about how this is a pl politics free podcast and metasales is not <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when his podcast first began uh for me it was more of a comedy than really like a poker podcast to me because he had these like cans audio bits he'd use the mouthpiece we're going live and uh his infamous um introduction to the fans calling in you know, if you're a snowflake or a rosy and you want to talk to me, you can, you can email me instead. And so elements like that, when it's Mike Mattisau, the guy that I think has sometimes a short fuse when it comes yeah. to his comments. Um, for me at first, it was more of a comedic podcast than anything else. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually a fairly political person. I've worked for a couple political campaigns. I do a lot of political writing for work and all that. But I respect that this podcast is politics free. Poker, what's the overlap between poker and what Joe Biden is doing? You know, I have my own opinions about what Joe Biden is doing, but what's the overlap between the two? And, you know, I liked listening to the early episodes of The Mouthpiece. I liked hearing his stories about the WSOP, explaining, you know, if, if I had won that hand, or what if I had 70% of the chips left on the final table, I would have won. It's not <laughs> true. We went over this in our 05 episode. He would have had 22%, but, you know, anyway. You know, it's that stuff was great. That stuff was good. It was good seeing interviews with people like um, John Sin. You know, I remember him asking, like, after you won the main event, did you have, you know, cousins come out of the woodwork and ask you for money? And John Sin was like, yeah, <laughs> which I thought was funny. He had like a good, decent rapport because he knows the game. But yeah, as time's gone on, it's, it's like, Mike, why don't you stream playing poker at least while you're talking about politics, right? It's like, isn't that fair? Isn't that a good compromise? It's just gone so far into the political realm. And we're not, I'm not saying anything about his political beliefs or anything. I'm just saying in terms of content that you're presenting to an audience of hundreds of people, you know, you're a poker guy. Why don't you focus on poker instead of politics? That's all I'm saying. And, you know, his, his habit of telling poker stories is very monotonous. So a, a recurring bit is he'll discuss his most recent cash game sessions or something. And so he'd be like, oh, I was playing in the, you know, 2550 at the Bellagio. I got an ace 10 off suit in the big blind. I limp. He, he calls. I bet 100. He calls. I bet 200. 
he calls us. It, it, it just that happens a little too often for my liking in those in his podcasts. And I'm not saying I'm I'm particularly eloquent in my with my speech patterns or my vocabulary, but I don't know that that just kind of irks me sometimes whenever I listen to his podcast like that. Now he's had some very you know great guests on it. Like you said, he had a, a show dedicated to um, some recently deceased poker players like Gavin Smith or um, Lane Flack, Lane Flack and yeah. um, uh, Mike Sexton, which is very sweet. But you know his habit of talking about his cats. I'm not a cat person. I you know, respect that pet, pet owners exist. I'm not a cat person. I don't want to hear about your cat. It's called the mouthpiece, not the cat piece. Uh, and Manasso also on his YouTube channel does have his uh, his vlogs about his uh, on his little scooter where he'll plant the camera and then he'll just like drive through and say, you know, I had ace deuce three eights, I limped, you know, got the idiots. I I played so bad, I played so good, I haven't tried a chip in six hours. I mean, compared to Nirvana's vlogs, which have a bit more editing and style and flair to them, and a bit more. You know, variety. I much prefer Dennis Grunn's vlogs. That's a whole other story. Yeah. Uh, and then I, Mattisau posts all of his mouthpiece on on YouTube, and uh, each episode he professes each one of uh, Mattisau year one episode three. It's like like what he said year one in the first year of his podcast, as if like he's guaranteeing himself that he's going to do like five years, and that each year matters like that. But that was kind of funny to me too at first too. I had to laugh at that. Yeah, but his his masterpiece, as we both know, is Blockers for Dummies. Oh, I mean, the greatest short possibly ever. Just <laughs> mixing in politics with like shit posts with Sean Deeb. all sorts of stuff. The greatest acting, the greatest facial expressions in a man I've ever seen. Rubber duckies. It's just so good. Oh man, yeah, but. Uh... You know, in spite of how much we make fun of Mattisau, we do we do care about the guy. We want him to do well. He's very entertaining in poker. He's cashed in the last three main events. Mm-hmm. Uh, he knows what he's doing. Uh, we would love to collaborate with him on our podcast, on his podcast, or on our podcast, or both, or a crossover, whatever. That'd be fantastic. The the two fish at the mouthpiece, or something. You know, whatever. That'd be fun. Um, but uh, I just think that again, he. He rips like anything related to democratic uh, policy, and then he's just like, "Well, Trump, blah, 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 blah. like, I, if you're telling me that in two years of COVID still exists, that's just a total scam or conspiracy." Like, he, he'll go into these ramblings, and he never like concedes a point or like yeah. or clarifies, like, "Okay, I was wrong back then." He's always just pushing the train forward in the wrong direction when he he gets on these tangents that are just totally nonsense sometimes. Yeah, he'll take calls from his fans, most of whom agree with him, and he'll just keep going with these callers for like 40 minutes. And again, I'm not, you know, whatever, you can have whatever politics you want, whatever. I disagree with his politics, I'll just say that much. But 40 minutes with this one caller, it's like, don't you have other callers who are calling that you want to get to? Can't you just like take the guy's question and then hang up on him, answer it for five minutes and then move on to the next guy? It's the lack of structure. He just keeps going and going with these same points. And he doesn't respond to comments ever. He has, you know, people that send him questions through comments. He never really responds to those. I don't know if he's ever read an email from a fan or not. I don't remember. But yeah, it's just you know, just, just pull yourself together. If you want to give like a little presentation on your political beliefs or have like a, a soapbox segment where you talk about politics, or that's cool. Just keep it contained, keep it streamlined. Don't just ramble about COVID and whatever for an hour and a half. No, I agree. And he, his podcasts, they tend to be, you know, usually between like one hour, 15 and two hours long. Now, now we've had some podcasts be in that range too, but mm-hmm. I, I feel like he could probably tighten things up. You know, Doug Polk, uh, had a very prominent poker channel on YouTube that he had pretty concise videos in our mix of longer ones. And I think he struck with the right balance between length and, 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 and detail. I think Senator Madison does not do that as well, but, but yeah, we ramble too. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying you know, yeah. that we're a head and shoulders, a better podcast than Madison. We're not in competition with Madison. We are merely both of our podcasts are meant to uh, collectively uh, improve the poker world by adding our you know commentary on different topics yeah i mean as we've said before i mean this podcast is about looking at poker more through an entertainment lens than a hard math and analytics lens there's a lot of poker channels that do that we're not trying to slight those people we're not trying to compete with those people we just think we'd offer a different perspective on it so you know totally cool if you want to watch mike's show 
Uh, if you can somehow get him to give us a shout out on his show, that'd be awesome. We're giving him a shout out. Go and watch the, the mouthpiece, whatever. Blockers for Dummies is terrific. Mark of Police might be even better. But anyway, you know, we're not trying to, you know, start a beef with yeah, Mike. I mean, our most popular video is a Massaw video. So we're not yeah. hypocrites here. We know that uh, Mike Massaw right, 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 yelling at uh, Jeff Platt, Adam and Zach Grosak is one of the reasons why so many people came to our channel in the first place. So we understand. And Adam that. agrees with you. So there you go, right? World champion bridge player, Adam Grosak agrees with Mike Mattiso. That's a headline right there. That should be news in the newspapers. Yeah. Anyway, Sam, I think that about covers up what we wanted to, to cover for, for tonight's episode. Thank you everybody for listening. Uh, again, we, we like to, you know, dabble in a little bit of everything when it comes to poker television. So this was kind of us taking a, a, a taste of the European side of the main events, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in London. So if you guys have more comments on the specific difference between Europe and American main events, we want to hear about it. If you guys want us to cover the 09 and main events onward for in the European side, since we have covered all the American ones, that, that's not, not a bad uh, direction to go in next. And obviously, if you guys want, want to, you know, should uh, comment, join us for an episode, all that fun stuff that we say every time, uh, we're happy to have you. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we'd love to have anybody of any experience level whatsoever on the show. Uh, if you're from the Mind Sport Olympiad, you know, shout out to any MSOers who are watching. Feel free to come on the show. Anything at all, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to leave us a comment or send us a direct message or something else. We're not really on social media or anything. So just, you know, try to respond to us through the YouTube. But we do have a Facebook page you can check out and leave comments on if you'd like. Yeah, and I'm hoping in the future we'll be able to see the uh, the grand unboxing of your Mind Sport Olympiad medals. That's going to be coming yep. in the future at some point. Knock and, on wood. Uh, really, until then, guys, enjoy your poker, enjoy your TV, enjoy your poker on TV. Take care.